All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Sorry about the late start. Uh, this is kind of like Nas the National Football League, except we had our television timeout before we started. So I did wear my Vikings purple tie, in case you didn't notice, because uh, it was a pretty good show the other night. So good for them. Well, welcome. Glad you're all here. This is uh, number, what, five or six of our... Number six. Of, ...of our whirlwind tour of the district today. We started this morning at 7.15 in beautiful downtown Sleepy Eye, and uh, we've been around the, around the district uh, all day since, and had good turnouts uh, at all our visits, and I uh, look forward to visiting with you all tonight. Um, we are... Uh, we'll just talk briefly about the session. Uh, a little bit about last session, a little bit about the upcoming session, but we're here mostly to hear what your concerns are, and uh, and we're happy to take questions. We have plenty of time for questions this evening. So, I, of course, I think most of you know I'm Paul Torkelson, state representative, in my sixth term in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, this year, coming up, the session starts on February 11th. Uh, we expect the biggest uh, bill that will get the most attention is the bonding bill. Uh, we typically do a larger bonding bill in the second year of the biennium, and that's what uh, looks like will be happening this year. There's no guarantee. Um, we don't have to pass a bonding bill. Uh, without a bonding bill, the government doesn't shut down or anything. It's not like last year's budget bill, where if you don't pass a budget, then you have a government shutdown. That's not the case this year. Uh, we don't have to pass anything, but uh, I think there's a good broad support for a reasonable bonding bill. Uh, there's always uh, a lot of discussion about how big it should be. I spend more time thinking about what should be in it. What kind of projects should the state actually invest in that will move the economy of the state of Minnesota forward and do the things that need to be done for our citizens? And I, I like to try to avoid the, what I think of as kind of fluffy stuff. So we'll see how that all works out. Uh, that's coming up. We are working with a budget surplus. Uh, that is good news. Uh, it means that uh, people, the economy is humming right along and people are paying their taxes. Uh, when, when I've been in the legislature when we've had a, when we've had a deficit. We had a $6.1 billion deficit a few sessions back and that was a really challenging, of course, to deal with. Uh, we do have a small surplus, about $1.3 billion. We don't have to spend that. Uh, it can easy, it can be left in the bank and carried forward. The other good news along those lines is that we have filled our reserve accounts. Uh, we've been putting money, we've been required by statute to put money into our reserve accounts if we, every year we have a surplus. We've had a number of surpluses in a row. We've been adding a little bit every two years to those surpluses, uh, rainy day funds, uh, emergency funds, and now they are filled to the kind of the statutory uh, level, and that's good news. We've got something then to fall back on should there be a recession, and we will help us to work through that should that come along in the future. So those are kind of the big pieces that are in place as we move into the session. Uh, we'll be looking at a number of different legislative issues as we move forward. I'll, at this point, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Senator Gary Dames. Gary? Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you folks for being here. As Paul said, I'm Senator Gary Dames. And we appreciate your attendance tonight. First, I want to thank uh, Pizza Ranch for letting us use this space. We really appreciate it. It works out well. And I'd like to thank the cable folks for being here tonight. Thank you for that. And I'd really like to thank you folks for being here again. It's uh, great that you'll take the time out of your day to come and visit with Paul and I. Uh, I think this will be our 18th. I think this is our 18th town hall meeting we've done in New Ulm. And we really appreciate the fact that we get the participation that we do. It's uh, the one we do before we go into session. We do that to find out what you folks have in your minds, what you are hearing and what, I mean, not what you're hearing to tell us, but tell us what you feel will be the effects of some of the stuff that you're hearing going on. And then I want to touch base a little bit before we open it up to some of the things that we did not get finished up at the last session. One of the things that we worked on right up to the end of the last session was the insulin issue and we're real close to having that bill put together. We've had task force working on that all summer and all fall. And right now we have some of the stuff that would be in that bill has actually went into effect January 1st voluntarily by the insurance companies. Right now the insurance companies in Minnesota have agreed to uh, putting some, some pretty low prices on the insulin 
and some of the companies are going to provide it at zero cost. Some companies are going to provide it at up to $25 for, 20, for a 30-day supply. So that issue is pretty well taken care of. Also, there's some options in the bill that will give people that can't afford to pay for it, will give them an opportunity to get the insulin free by filling out some forms and getting some, some support financially that they'll be able to get that done. So the insulin thing is uh, uh, getting very close to being taken care of, and I think it should be done by the time we get to the end of the session. Uh, a couple of other things that have happened during the session, during the uh, interim, has been with Health and Human Services, and there's been some issues there, and uh, those issues are being worked on, but uh, there will be some decisions made once we get into session as to what direction we're going to actually end up going. We have uh, three different incidences that have showed up in about the last six months. One of them was a $26 million overpayment, one's a $103 million overpayment, and one's a $53 million overpayment. And so those issues have to be resolved. Fortunately, the commissioner we have at the head of Health and Human Services right now, she came from the uh, uh, Lutheran Social Services as her executive director, and she is very, very highly qualified. She does a great job, and we've got a lot of confidence that she will come in and do what was originally requested is to kind of change the culture in that organization and uh, I think that she has the ability to do it and she is aggressive enough to do it and yet she understands the process. So she has been meeting off and on with the House and the Senate uh, uh, Health and Human Services Committee giving us reports as to what's going on and uh, there's some good things coming about there. We just have to see if it can be moved at a pace to where the thing, we can get some of this stuff taken care of. Uh, one of the other things that's being looked at is possibly splitting the Health and Human Services Agency up. I would assume if it gets split, it'll be split into two parts. But right now there's some, when you start looking at splitting this thing up, it's like pulling a string on your shirt. You think that the sleeve is gonna come off and then you find that you have no buttons. I mean, you really can not always be sure what the unintended consequences are gonna be. So we're spending a lot of time looking at if we possibly split it up, what would be the right way to go? What would be the direction and exactly how would you do it? And then how far would you go when you split it up as far as rejuvenation and what, would you, what parts <coughs> would you use and this and that. Uh, Fortunately, the governor is appointing a task force to take a look at, if we split it up, in, his op in that task force opinion, what would be the best way to split it up. So that's one of the things we're going to be spending some pretty serious time on next year. Uh, with the bonding, uh, we were the, the Minnesota Senate bonding tour. We were here in, in New Alm, and uh, we had a presentation by the city on the Highway 14 presentation went very well and then we had a presentation by some of the folks from the park board and that went very well and so uh, the bonding tour the folks in the bonding tour were very impressed with the new home and very impressed with the presentation so I do want to thank the people that did that and with that said I'll sit down and we'll start uh, if folks can start asking questions making comments and whatever you'd like to talk about so thank you uh, Fritz, you want to okay. start? Okay. Yeah, I just wondered what you thought uh, the chances were of, uh, is there anything different with the red flag gun issues? Is there a middle ground or something? I would, would you see anything different this year from last year? I haven't heard any proposals. Um, I'd be a little surprised if it even comes up this year. It might. Uh, we'll see. Um, there's... You know, there certainly are issues with those proposals. Uh, I personally think we have a lot of gun laws on the books already that uh, we don't do a real good job of enforcing what we have, and we should take care of that first. Uh, but uh, perhaps Gary has some other comments. Well, I know that the uh, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, they have had two tours now, one in the metro area and one in the rural area, talking about gun laws, the current laws, and how they're affecting things, and the fact that we have a lot of laws that are, are not being enforced, 
and that uh, we're looking at that part of it. I'm not on the Judiciary Committee, so as to exactly where we're at right now, I really can't tell you, but I know that these tours have been out there, and I'm fully expecting within the next couple of weeks, uh, the leadership team will probably get an update as to how that went. Yep. Yes? Are, are you two making any effort to try to um, engage in that issue to try to make something happen? Or are you just waiting for someone else to act on gun control and the red flag issue? Mm -hmm. the, the, the how I'm handling it is I am trying to get the laws we got on the books enforced. That's what I'm doing. And I really think that we need to make sure the laws we have are enforced and that we get that accomplished and then see where we are. So the other, then, will that take, will we need to dedicate extra resources toward enforcement? Of the current laws? Yes. Uh, we, I suppose we possibly could, but if we have a law in the books, I certainly would not think that anybody would say to me that don't enforce law because it's going to cost money when the law is on the books. I mean, the law is on the books. We need to enforce them. And I'm certainly not going to tell somebody don't enforce the law because there's no money. Well, so, so how do we make that enforcement happen then? Can you explain which laws you're speaking about? I don't have the list no, with okay. me, so I can't because I don't have the list with me. And I don't want to speak of something that I can't look at a piece of paper and give you the actual facts. I know there are several laws. And how do you get them enforced? Yes. Well, we have to have ask law enforcement to enforce them. <laughs> do we know why they're not being enforced? I have not met with law enforcement, so I can't tell you why they're not. Nope. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead. I'm Peg Sundellen from New Orleans. I just want to thank you for having this in the evening mm -hmm. so people that are working are able to come. So thank you. Thank you. you bet. Yep. We Appreciate heard, the turnout. We turn heard off. that message loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Other questions? Yeah. Um, Teresa Kavanian from New Alm. Also, thank you for doing this meeting that night. Um, I was wondering, I know the Forever Green um, was funded last year, mm -hmm. I believe, to four million, and there are proposals for additional funding. Do you have an opinion about? where you stand on that in the next session, and I think Representative Torkel's in the city here. Uh, no, it's not in my committee. I, I do not serve on uh, Environment not Committee anymore, and I don't serve on the uh, Clean Water Council anymore. But I have become a supporter of, of uh, Forever Green, uh, mostly because of the renewed interest or the increased interest in cover crops. Um, they've become uh, much better supported by the farming public or the farmers in general, are much more interested in them. And so there's a, there's a real need for that research that's going on in Forever Green. Uh, and uh, I did uh, step forward last session and encourage the Clean Water Council to put some money, more money towards Forever Green. Um, you know, we, it's, research is important. The university has done a good job of research in the past, and, uh, and, and now with what's been happening in the most, in most recently, there's, there's a desire for good information along that, in that particular area, so I have kind of made a switch personally to, mm -hmm. to give that more support. Thanks. And I support Evergreen. I have supported it. Lauren converted me a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> You know who I mean. <laughs> Fritz? How about uh, recreational marijuana? I do not support recreational marijuana, and I do not believe that recreational marijuana will get passed as long as Republicans have one branch of the government. And I certainly agree with what Gary said. You know, uh, I just don't think it's needed or important. I think it's dangerous. Uh, what, and for a couple of reasons. One, the marijuana that's available today is is not your grandfather's marijuana. It's much more potent than things that were around 20 years ago. Uh, and often, in some cases, even laced with other drugs. And the other is really an issue of safety. We don't have any system where we can adequately test 
people that are operating motor vehicles or working in <coughs> companies where they're working with equipment where we can adequately and appropriately test whether they're under the influence of marijuana or not. We just don't have the science. The technology is not there to, uh, to do that. So it's, it makes it really challenging for law enforcement. Uh, I realize the governor has come out in favor, but uh, I, I think it's a mistake. I hope we don't go there. Another issue is, is that the states that they have recreational marijuana passed, it has to be a cash business. And so it has really driven up a lot of uh, issues because, especially a lot of home robberies and business robberies, because if you have a marijuana business and you're selling recreational marijuana, everything is done in cash. So you are going to have a lot of cash somewhere. Very likely it's going to be at your business, in your car, or at your house. And so in those states we are seeing those violations going up considerably. The other thing we hear a lot about, if we pass recreational marijuana, for every dollar that uh, we spend, we will bring in four to five dollars in taxes. So far, the states that have passed recreational marijuana are not noticing that. In some cases, it's just the reverse. You're actually spending two and three dollars more because of all the new complications and all the new issues we have inside the state than what we're bringing in on tax dollars. Do you have the source on that? What's that? What is your source? Uh, I can get you some information on it. I was at an in-coil conference and we had three states come in and testify and those states are my source and I would have to look up and see which states they were. Yep. We, as you know, we have uh, medicinal marijuana products available in Minnesota, and there's, uh, I think there's going to be some changes along those lines. I think actually already have been some changes to uh, have more sites where it's available uh, for those that are properly using those products uh, with, for their medical issues. Uh, and there may be other changes along the lines of the medical marijuana program for those that benefit from medical marijuana. So that's a different thing. Uh, the other issue along with the marijuana issue that I think is a developing concern is the vaping situation. Uh, we have, we know that people have died uh, as a result of some of the products that are available. They may not even, they might not necessarily be legal products, but they are available and people are using them. And the other thing that really bothers me is the products that are obviously aimed at children. I really think it's a mistake to allow those to be on the market and I hope that we can take action to restrict the availability of those products that are obviously aimed for children to use. Yes? Um, on that note, I think the federal um, government just passed uh, raising the age to 21 and banning some of those flavored products, but I know there's still an initiative to pass that at the state level. Is that something you intend to pursue? I know it was it's been brought up, but I don't think it passed. I, I haven't seen any proposed legislation yet. I, I expect there will be, and uh, if it's something that I think Many appropriate, I'll be supporting. Many cities and counties have passed it at the local level. I'm just wondering if you think it'll pass at the state level. It's kind of local and federal, but state. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Well, I don't know for sure what's going to come up. I think it'll depend on the language of the federal, po the federal bill, because if the federal bill makes it mandatory throughout all the states, then the states don't have to do a bill. If the federal says that you can't smoke till you're 21, then we wouldn't have to pass a bill because that would be federal law. If we, we wouldn't have to, but if the federal law got overturned, you know, if we had it at the, at the state level... Then, then the state law could easily be overturned, too, if the federal does. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. But, I mean, would you support it if it came before you? Would you vote for it? State Depend on what's in the bill. The last bill I would not have because all it was going to do is move the, the smoking age to 21. And if you're going to move the smoking age to 21, I have a struggle with that. When we will send our, our youth, we'll send 18 year olds into war and then we come back and tell them they're not mature <laughs> enough to smoke. So I you don't support raising the age? I don't, depending on what's in the bill. But the original bill we had last year. We, we brought that in the committee and I voted against it. Yes. Yep. For, for what was in it that you... It was just a flat bill that said you can't smoke till you're... You can't buy cigarettes till you're 21. Okay. No, I'm wrong on that. What it said is that 
if you hand if you sell cigarettes you can't sell them to anybody under 21 but it didn't say you couldn't buy them if you were oh. up to 21 so if it so, had both you'd well, depending on what's in the bill I, so just to have support, a blanket 21 I, I just explained it if you're under if the <laughs> if the bill says that it's a blank at 21 and you don't do anything with the vaping and anything like that and don't do anything with the putting in the flavoring and stuff, I probably wouldn't support it. If we're going to put the bill in, then let's put the teeth in. Other questions? Well, this is a policy, this is a policy question and I will accept completely uh, the answer I don't know or I haven't thought about it very much. Um, and it has to do, um, it has to do with uh, a, a judicial uh, issue, judicial reform. There's some, uh, I think you know, uh, that um, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, push. Uh, there, there's people who are on probation for 10, yes. 15, 20, 25 years. Um, and if they're on probation for a felony, they're no longer allowed to vote until they're off probation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some push uh, to limit the amount of time that uh, people can be uh, out in the community and remain on probation. And my question is whether either one of you sit on a committee that would look at that, whether either one of you have uh, heard anything about that or given any thought, and like I said, if you haven't, that's fine, but it's it's just something that I wanted to bring up. Yep. Well, thank you for that. Well, Gary and I probably have a little different take on this particular issue. I think we should take a look at it because Minnesota has used probation much more extensively than some of our neighboring states. So we have long probation periods. And I don't, I don't serve on the committee, I don't have a bill proposal, but I'm certainly willing to, to evaluate how we're handling this in Minnesota. Um, and uh, that's about as far as I'm willing to go right now, but I, I certainly am willing to listen to it and, and think about it. And we'll let Senator explain his position. I do not support the bill. And I have looked at it, and I do not support it. Now, if the state changes how they're going to do the parole and stuff after, and the probation rather, after, and if that changes, then I would follow that. So right now, if you're getting sentenced to, say, five years in jail and five years of probation, and now for that same type of, of uh, law, breaking the law, it would change from, say, five years in prison to only three years on probation, then I would say that when they're off the three-year probation, then obviously that they get that rate returned to them. But as long as their probation is five years, I say they do not vote for them five years. I, this is your this is this is the penalty you receive for committing the crime, and that's part of the penalty. So that's where I'm at on it. Yep. Other questions? Yes, sir. When are we going to have a progressive gas tax in the state of Minnesota? Well, we have a gas tax already. Well, we and didn't add to it this year, did we? What's that? We didn't add to it this we year. We did not add to it this year. Nope. Where do we rank nationally? We are, if you compare us to the, our neighboring We're states. We're mid-quartile, right? Uh, I don't know offhand nationally. I know that we are right in the mix with our neighboring states. We're higher than some and lower than others. Uh, so we're not out of line when you look at our neighbors. There are certainly some states in the country that have much higher gas tax, like California and I believe it's Pennsylvania, have very high gas taxes, but they have a different structure for, for funding than we do. Since those of us who drive the roads are wearing the roads out, why don't you support increasing gas tax? I just don't think it's, I personally don't think it's route. necessary at this time. Uh, we have accessed some of the funds that are generated by sales tax on auto parts and repairs. We could access more of those funds and use them for roads. Uh, where's, our road spending went up significantly with the passage of the 2017 transportation bill when I was chair. And we increased that, that funding significantly without raising the gas tax. And I, I'm, I'm personally proud of that work. 
you use the surplus? Uh, we used no. those sales tax dollars, yeah. and we did we did do uh, significant borrowing. I, I can't deny that. I'm not. I'm not trying to give you double speak. I, I just don't I personally don't think the gas tax is the best answer at this time. What are your thoughts on the equality or inequality of the urban and rural conflict? Because it's more it's more urban and rural in terms of the competition for highway and transportation funds than it is even partisan, right? Certainly, there, there, everybody has a road that they think should be rebuilt or expanded uh, in every part of the state. And we do have a contrast between the metro and the rural parts of the state. The metro has the concentration of drivers and therefore the concentration of gas tax generated, but the rural has the concentration of miles of road. And the way I look at it, everybody uses the road system of the entire state. It's an asset for the entire state, and uh, even if you live in Minneapolis, you're likely to drive out of the city sooner or later, or even if you're not driving out of the city, uh, the roads that come into the city are bringing you the things you need to live and eat uh, in your city environment. So it is a, it's a constant battle, you're right about that, but uh, I believe rural is should, it deserves every dollar it gets, and I would, I would put more money into rural myself. Thank you. Yes, sir. You say it is unnecessary to put a gas tax on. Why is it so necessary to put these surcharges on these old vehicles down 20, 20 bucks or whatever, to double that almost? Well, that, that wasn't my bill, for one thing, but no. it's uh, the counties have made the choice. That's an option that's been offered to them, and, and many counties have put on the wheelage tax and the half cent sales tax for transportation. Is that what you said will be when it is the sales tax, but you can put on these surcharges if you have to or want to, or can sales tax or whatever go on your own roads? Well, they came to us and asked to have that ability to do that. Because they weren't getting enough. Surcharges. Well, that's debatable. Well, I mean that's uh, uh, you know if you took it if you take a look at everything I mean if you take a look we got a 1.3 billion dollar surplus we have probably had five six billion dollars in request for that surplus at some point you can only spend so much money and so you have to decide where that money's going to go and when we go back to the gas tax you know you put a gas tax on. I can remember in 2009, I was appointed or elected as Redwood County Commissioner. One of the committees I was put on was the Transportation Committee. The first meeting I went to, the gas tax was increased in August of 2008. The first meeting I went to in March of 2009, the first item on the agenda was raising the gas tax. And it had just happened. And they said, well, we got to start now because it takes a long time to do it. Now, if we would take the sales tax on the tires, batteries, accessories, and parts and put that on and, and dedicate that to be used for transportation, we're doing about half of that now. If we took the other half, we would raise it considerably. That's equal to about eight to nine cents a gallon in gas tax, and it grows every year the gas tax reduces every year. So you're always coming back trying to raise that tax. Originally, the tax on these parts and stuff was dedicated to transportation. And then when things got tough and there started to be some deficits, pretty soon there's a, there's a deficit and that disappeared and went into the general fund. And I think it's time we take it back. Now you're gonna hear all these stories about, well, you're taking it from this party, taking it from this party, Taken from, this, from these people, not party, but from these groups, this agency. Now, last year, we funded things very well in the budget year. So taking it out didn't take money away from anybody. We still have 1.3 billion surplus after we filled in the reserve. So to me, that's the way to go and start you know, putting more money in to spend more money in roads and bridges. I'm not for higher taxes. I'm, I'm just 
but like these regressive tracks with like surcharges on it. And I don't want to be all about the gas tax, but the other reason I am reluctant to raise the gas tax is it's not a long-term dependable resource. Our cars are getting better and better gas mileage, and if the experts are correct, we're going to see more and more electric vehicles on the road. Other I questions? Cars with less road work. <laughs> but it's true. Other questions or concerns, comments? Yes, sir, Fritz. Do you see the achieve, racial achievement gap as an issue with education? The I don't know what, Fritz, I didn't catch what you said. Do you see the rate, they talk about racial achievement gap with education? Oh. Do you see that as an issue? Well, it's, how do you see it? It's a real issue. Um, I don't know that I know what the cure is. If it was just about money, it shouldn't be there because those metropolitan schools get much higher education funding than we do out here in greater Minnesota. So it's it's not just a money issue, uh, but it is a real issue. And, uh, you know, we need to keep kids, first we need to keep kids in school. Um, you know, graduation rates and dropout rates are just horrendous in some of those schools. Uh, it's, it's a really complex, difficult question, um, and I don't know that anybody has good, easy answers. They had the uh, funding for referendums. Can you tell me where that money actually came from? No, are you talking about the the school yes. capital investment referendums yes. that they were the referendum? They got funding for it was the original funding scale. was for forty percent. Are you, you're talking no, of you're the? No, not talking about the same thing. I don't think. Okay. Yeah. Well, it would go up each year for what? Three, four years. He's talking about the operating referendum. Yeah. The levy they passed to get an operating operating revenue. Well, to build, to, also to build. Okay, if you're talking about the one to build buildings, yeah. okay. A couple oh, years okay. ago, we put in the forty percent, and what that amounted to is, let's say that the school capital referendum was five dollars an acre. The state would pay forty percent of that. The taxpayer would pay the other the sixty percent. And once a year, the state would write out the county a check for that difference so that they didn't have to do it with all the taxpayers. Last year, that was set to move up to 50, and then 55, 60, I believe, to 70. And I think that's by 2020, if you give me a minute, I might be able to tell you. I think it's 2023. I think it's 2023 that that is fully implemented. And that money is coming out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. Is that going to stay? Is it permanent then? Well, you know, it's as permanent as, as, as the legislature leaves it be there. Mm -hmm. It's not dedicated. So okay. two, four years down the road, that could get changed, yes. Okay. Yep. Hi. Um, I recently read an article that says the counselors in a school, it's up to what, one in 700, one counselor to 700 students. Why don't we use our additional extra money fixing this problem? I mean, that would help schools and kids from staying in school, kids from graduating, it'll keep kids in school, it'll help kids stay in school do better. To me, that would be a very easy way to hurt push for itself in problem. And certainly you got a good point there. Uh, how about the nursing home that just called and they're losing people because they can't pay them equal wages to what they might be able to get at McDonald's? The list just goes on and on and on, so you have to prioritize those lists. And so many times what we've been doing, and I've been in the education committee now for several years, and so one of the things that we try to do is when we add money to education, add it to the basic formula. Because that way it's, it's trying to keep the gap between what the Twin City schools get and what we get trying to close that gap and you can do that by going through the formula. And so if we give, if we give a school a 2% formula, it's up to them the way they want to spend that, spend those dollars. We're trying to get away as much as we can from dedicating where the money we give a school has to go. I feel that the superintendent here has much better idea what's good for the New Orleans school than I do sitting in St. Paul. And I would advocate as superintendent of schools, 
he already knows my talking point on that. Uh, local control. So, so, so people know from a law standpoint, we have about a one to thirty, right, one to three hundred ratio of counselor or social workers. And could we always use more? Sure, we could. But then mental health workers, social studies teachers, special ed teachers, all those things go in the mix for all the stuff we do for schools. But if they can keep it so it's on the general formula and not categorical, then we're much happier because we can have the latitude in our schools to decide where the best payment is. Other questions? Yes, sir. Another question about education yeah. funding. Uh, I presume it's one of the biggest single areas of funding in the state. Um, my concern is K through 12 versus post high school. Mm -hmm. It always seems to me like we have a lot of accountability K through 12, uh, some measure of efficiency, and then we get to post high school and as a parent and a grandparent, it seems to me like there is no accountability. Like we're just throwing money at it and not even coming up with jobs for half the kids that graduate. Mm -hmm. Do either of you <clears throat> know the facts on per capita funding, K through 12 versus post high school? I do on K through 12 what the per capita is, but I do not know on what it is for two year and four year colleges. Uh, with the University of Minnesota, it's kind of interesting. That's a land-grant college, and it was developed before the state of Minnesota was. So what ends up happening is any money that we give to the university, with one little exception, and that's the Ag Fund, but other than that, any money we give to the university, we have no control how that money is spent. None. We do have some control with Minnesota State Colleges uh, used to be Minskew, now it's Minnesota State. We do have some control with those. We do have some control with the two-year colleges. But uh, again, I'm of the philosophy that uh, unless there's some real major problems, I would rather let those folks run their schools and try to have them be as efficient as possible. Just like I feel local control in a high school is better, I think some local control in your four-year colleges is better. I know like Marshall, I'm pretty familiar with that college. It's in my district. And they have a lot of it local involvement there. And I think that that really pays off. But uh, I cannot tell you what per capita, I, I, I don't know what that would be. I don't know. I'm on E12, but not on higher ed. So usually I don't get into much of that. Yes, sir. So it's men's Q is not inclusive of both the state colleges and the community colleges? There is no Minsku anymore. It's Minnesota State. But it's all of the... So I was an adjunct in both systems. Yes. Two different contracts. Yep. Much more value put on adjuncts in the community college system. Then Better student-teacher ratio than the four-year mm -hmm. colleges. And I taught at both Mankato and St. Cloud, mm -hmm. as well as Ridgeway. Mm -hmm. And I, I would agree with this gentleman's contention that at those levels, even at the campus level, much less at that higher state level. It, it's pretty crazy. I think we have to start this class right now uh, online because otherwise Hibbing's going to go. <laughs> you know, and you brought up a real, you brought up a tough yeah. point because it really is a struggle trying to get students. And with the online, a lot of the colleges kind of figured, well, we're going to keep trying to get them in the classroom, and pretty soon they realized that they had to go online, and it's a very competitive, uh, very, very competitive pro process. It seems like we have less students than we used to have, and we have more colleges trying to get those students, and so it becomes very competitive. So then what we see on the bonding side is we see all kinds of requests by all of these community colleges and, and, and four-year schools wanted to put up a new building here and a new building here and a new building here because students are taking a look at what the campus looks like. It used to be when you chose a college, I would like to believe, I know what I did, you chose the college that you felt you could get the best education in the area you wanted to pursue. Today I think students look at that, but I think they also look at a lot of the other things within that college as far as the quality of the buildings and the dorms and this and that and the next thing. So it seems to be a whole different uh, system now in how they try to get students. You know, one, there are many challenges in higher education, as you know. One of them is the cyclical nature 
of students. When the employment is high, uh, or when unemployment is low and employment is high, and we don't see as many people going to college for additional training because they, there are plenty of jobs out there. When things go the other way, then there's this demand, but the system isn't necessarily ready to meet the demand if we cut, if we have too many cuts in those other good times of the cycle. So it's, it's complicated and difficult. Uh, we're seeing a switch right now back to vocational training, uh, both in our high schools and in our two-year schools, because there's demand there. A lot of those hands-on people are retiring, and all of a sudden we don't have enough plumbers, we don't have enough electricians. Uh, so those programs need to be boosted, but it's the system, it's hard to have a system that responds instantly. It's just because you have to have the teachers, you have to have the facilities. Uh, when I was chair of, of capital investment, I had an agreement with the then head of Minsky that if we were going to invest in buildings in the system, we would have a net no gain in square footage of buildings because we had way too many buildings out there already. They wanted to build something new, fine, but you got to get rid of some of the old stuff at the same time. I think one of the things <clears throat> I think one of the things that has really changed in the last uh, say eight to ten years is the ability for our high school students now to get some good experience in a lot of our vocational stuff so that they're ready to go to a two-year or whatever vocational program and go in there knowing that that's something they want to do. I think for quite a while those students just were not getting any any experience at that high school level. Now uh, the process you have in New Ulm, I mean the New Ulm school has a heck of a good program. Redwood Falls just put a big addition on their school for vocational. Fairmont has an excellent program and I know that there's a lot of other schools that I'm probably missing out on it do too. But it has really helped by getting that into these high schools so that we can get those kids to go to the trade school so we beef up our plumbing force and our air conditioning, plumbing, heating, nursing, right down the line. It's made a world of difference. It's turned a lot in the last eight years and hopefully we keep growing on that. Do both of you agree and is it pretty much bipartisan that we have no control over where the money goes at the University of Minnesota? Very. The only one we do is the Ag Fund, and that's because that fund was put in with special, special. It was, there was special language in that that it would be controlled by. We would have some control on that, and it's not considered to be part of the general fund they get from us. And no control over the ratio of how many students are from our state compared to others. I don't know on the ratio of students. I was talking on dollars. Just dollars. So now we're going to another area, and I, I don't know on the ratio of students. I know that there's a big problem with ratio of students. So, for instance, the ag program at the University of Minnesota. We've been trying to get that thing beefed up as far as the number of students, and they get so many students a year. And so like in ag education, we got such a shortage of ag educators. So we opened up an ag education department, or Marshall did at their college. Crookston came back online. And so the university was kind of a little bit put out because now they have competition. But yet when we met with them and said, we need to get more student numbers. Yep, we're going to do this, do that, do this, do that. I think we got five slots. Well, they get so many slots and... St. Paul is not getting very many of those, and there's some other departments that are just not getting many of those slots. And so it really makes it tough. But they're, and the other thing that they went to is I understand they would rather bring somebody in for a two-year college than they would a freshman out of high school. Well, that makes it a little tough. Yes? Um, switching topics, I wondered what your views are about former Senator Marty's health care bill and whether you are looking at strategies to improve our health care system in Minnesota to make it more affordable and accessible? Well, we're always looking. We're always negotiating. Uh, I did not look that close at that Representative Marty's bill. Uh, uh, I'm not one that's going to be supporting single payer. And so much of what they're doing right now is they're, they're focusing, the DFL is focusing everything into single payer. We have a reinsurance program and uh, we have some of the lowest insurance rates in the United States. And that reinsurance program has done a lot to help that. 
We put a reinsurance program in. We were the second state to do it. And there's several states now that have adopted it, our, our reinsurance program because they're finding that that's a good way to go to keep the premiums down and yet keep good coverage. So that's, uh, but yeah, we're always looking at, I mean, that's a real changing industry. And so we're always looking at things that can be done to drive, try to drive those premiums down and try to drive the other costs down. You know, the cost of insurance, uh, there's a lot of things go into that. And, and we have to be looking at, last year we took some real close looks at the uh, uh, pharmacy benefit managers. And there's a lot of, uh, we need to get more transparency in there. And there's some other things that we'll be looking at this year. So it's a, it's a whole scope of things to try to drive those premiums down. A lot of people think, well, the insurance companies are making too much money and that we just bring them down and that's all gonna work. It, it doesn't work that way. I've been in that industry for 26 years and I can tell you that uh, if we turn this over to the state, our costs are gonna go up considerably. We had a form at the, uh, uh, out at the farm fest, we had a healthcare form on just that topic. And at the end of the day, it was quite interesting because it was presented that we needed to go to single payer. And the reason we need to do that is they could save 15% on the premium. Now what's interesting is if you take a look at Medicaid, you're looking at probably just an average 24 to 26% in a dollar. You go over to Medicare and you're looking at 54 to 50 cents, six cents on a dollar paid on claims. You go to insurance and you're looking at 68 to 72. So if you have a state program paying average of 26% on Medicaid, and they can only save 15% of the premium. Insurance companies are paying 68 to 72. So we should be paying, we should be saving 40 some percent on the premium to go to state program. But that's not, they say, well, no, it'll only be 15. If it's only 15, it's because the additional cost that it's gonna to cost to have it go through a state program. So. So you support reinsurance and examining how I just, I just want, health insurance isn't affordable for a lot of the members. You're exactly of the right. I work for. And re, so reinsurance might be helping, but it's not solving the problem of both the high cost of health insurance and the high cost. Of there health is no care. real solution. We might as well be honest with each other. There's a, not a real solution that's going to solve anything. You can take it to a single payer and you can make it reduce, look like you're reducing the premiums or the cost. But you're not because the cost is being absorbed by the taxpayers. And if you take a look at the countries that feel they have a pretty successful single payer program, then go the next step back and look at the pay to the doctors and the nurses and things like this. They, could, they make it look pretty good. But if you take a look at the payments in those programs, that would never fit in our economy in the United States. Representative Torkelson, do you have a different take or? Not dramatically different. You know, healthcare is, of course, a huge problem and challenge in this country. Um, I served a number of years on my local hospital board. This is some time ago. But even then, our reimbursement rates from government programs just about broke the hospital because they were so inadequate. So in my mind, adding more people to the roles of government health care is going to threaten even more of our rural institutions, which are struggling already to provide care. I'm alarmed by the fact that a mother has to drive an hour to deliver a baby. That, that shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, there's something wrong with the system that puts us in a position where doctors don't feel like they can deliver babies because it's too risky. I mean, delivering babies is something seems pretty natural to me. I don't know. Uh, or the health care system did. No, I guess I shouldn't say that. I don't think I'll ever have one. The other part of it is, though, the health care system dictates where they go. Right. Right. And that also puts some of our providers in a position where they can't stay afloat. Uh, it's, have you as legislators done anything on the other end of the spectrum? When McGuire retired and got upwards of a billion dollar parachute from United Health, and we have multi, multi million dollar CEO salaries for those companies that are supposed to be more competitive, 
at what point do we do something like we do with public utilities and at least try to get a handle on the corporate side of that? Well, they're technically nonprofits, for one thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, those are exorbitant salaries, I agree, but just cutting those salaries is not going to cure the problems we have in health care. Please don't leave without seeing something about the census and the need to have a complete count and the impact on our redistricting. Well, I can. I will gladly preach about that. Um, you know, if you've been reading the news at all, you know that we are kind of on the cusp of potentially losing a, con a congressional seat in the U.S. Congress. Um, if we don't count everybody, we will for sure lose one. So uh, treat your census workers uh, nicely and make sure they do their job well. But we need to count everyone uh, in order to retain that congressional seat. It's very important. Uh, and we need to count everyone in our rural parts of the state because many of the things that we depend programs are are administered based on the census. Uh, redistricting is a whole other issue, of course. Uh, we will be redistricting. We do every 10 years, uh, and we continue to see this shift of population from Greater Minnesota <coughs> into the metropolitan area. Uh, and that is going to cause our rural districts to get larger geographically. That's just a fact of life. And what happens, or what has to kind of happen when you do that redistricting map, <coughs> you kind of got to start in the corners of the state because you can't really take any citizens from across the state line in Iowa or South Dakota. <laughs> so that kind of means as you build that puzzle, you have to kind of start with those state borders <laughs> dictating at least two sides of many of our districts. Uh, and it's uh, potentially has has a very potentially a very large impact on not only on on our state as a whole, but on our individual districts across the state and and individual uh, citizens and legislators. But it's coming, and uh, this first step in that process is a good census count. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that we need to do it well. And we have to really, really make sure that we get a good count in rural Minnesota because we are very likely we could lose one Senate seat and two House seats in Minnesota. Now we won't, in rural Minnesota, we won't lose them in the state, but they'll shift from rural Minnesota to the metro. And when that happens, it's just that much, that fewer voices we have out here to try to defend rural Minnesota and to try to get things for rural Minnesota that it gets harder and harder to do because you have less and less representation. So it's very important this year that we have a fair count because of that fact. We don't want to be losing seats in rural Minnesota to the metro. Other questions, concerns? Yes? Well, I think with that, we have more people who are coming in that are <coughs> coming from other countries and they're citizens. And I think we should make sure we get those people counted as well. And, you know, that's a job that I don't know how many hours we're going to do for a census, but maybe some students can sign up and hmm. make sure we get the census. Especially people who are not necessarily Spanish, who's not their primary language. Right. And most they, people uh, count, and they're in our area, and they're working. Mm -hmm. And I say, I, I think you're going to have to really, if it's billboards or whatever it's going to be, get people <coughs> to sign up and be census workers. Pay us that bad. They now, raised, they only raised, nine it's questions. Good pay. I think there's only nine questions you have to ask this time, so it's much simpler than it was last mm -hmm. time. At least that's what the, the state uh, democracy yep. can have on it. You're right. Right. They raised the pay rate for census workers. Yep. Yeah. So get people to sign I'm not up. looking for work myself. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could do a PSA on why it's important, though. What's that? Do a PSA on why it's important to fill the census out. All right. As legislators, I feel like people would, you know, listen. <laughs> 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 30 or so. <laughs> Other comments? We're about ready to wrap it up. I want to follow up on what Teresa said because I think it's so important. Can you speak up, please? I think it's, I want to follow up on what Teresa said. I think it's so important that people, that the, your constituent understands how important you think it is. Mm -hmm. People fill yeah. this you guys carry and the reasons mm -hmm. why. I think people, so many people feel intimidated or threatened by this whole idea, which you know. And I think it's really important that you are, you say that you are in favor of counting every person. 
and why. All right. And it's, a, <laughs> and it's not it's not Big Brother. It's it's because it's your neighbor. It's the neighbor. numbers matter. Yeah. Right. Yep. Other comments? They can speak yes. Long-term care, I came in late, sorry about that. But are you really going to be going to bat to increase the uh, pay for people who are in long-term care? We have been for many years, and we will continue to because there are some real issues there. $15 it, an hour is not too much. And they're not anywhere near that. I know. And we know that. Uh, well, a couple years ago, for the nursing homes, we passed a bill and put 138 million new dollars into the nursing homes for Medicaid to go to be used to pay higher salaries. About 130 of that went out into rural Minnesota because that gap was so big between metro and rural. It helped close it some, but uh, it wasn't very long, and we just we were not keeping up with with the wage increases. And it's we work on that every year. And last year, then there was that 6% snafu. And so we had to try to figure that out and try to get that refunded. But there's been a bill every year that I've been there, and most of my have either authored or co-signed. And I definitely support it and will continue to support, not only in long-term care, but in assisted living. Those problems are same over there. Well, thank you folks very much thank for you. coming. Thank we you. really appreciate it.